Okay, so I'm going to sit here, so if you guys want to arrange yourselves um, so you either can or can't see me, depending on your preference. Um, um, what I'm going to do today is take you through a presentation that I've been building for um, since 2016, when I was asked to do a TED talk, and I had to figure out what to write in my TED talk and it was really difficult because I ended up writing about seven pages of ranting against basically everything that we complain about as environmentalists and that's not something that you can actually make a TED talk out of because it's useless, it doesn't provide any help. So I tried to, instead of just kind of, um, you know, talk about all the tragedy of the planet, um, break down what was what the problem has been for us, uh, my dad, and also just uh, the things I've seen as an environmentalist uh, activist or whatever, um, as uh, as the real roadblocks as to how public can understand um, what to do and uh, what the problems are with um, ecological movements and solutions and problems and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, so so I um, it was really hard for me to break everything down into very simple things. And I wanted to break everything down into very simple things because I wanted to find the very basic truths that underline all of the things that we think and do and everything like that so that, um, so that we can build an argument that can apply to everybody and that there's no segment of the population or um, type of personality or some such thing that would, would be able to argue against it because we have a lot of argument about nuance and a lot of argument about um, what to do on a level where actually what we're arguing about isn't the solution at all. Neither opinion is the solution. I'll give you an example. The cover of Time magazine. Clean coal or nuclear? It's, it's, it's not a useful debate because it should be neither. So why is that? Because they're commodities that extract and pollute into the earth. So I tried to make up a way to be able to separate um, what we like to call clean energy or um, renewable energy and what is biophilic energy. And the difference being something that is a commodity and something that is part of an ecological system. How do you tell the difference and how do you tell the difference if you have no information about anything? So I tried to make a very simple way of doing that and I feel like that solves a lot of the problems that I was writing seven pages about because it got rid of the nuance and got rid of the useless argument and st started to frame things in, in very basic forms that are easily um, identifiable and understandable by anybody. Anyway, so I usually start this, pr this presentation by looking at us um, in terms of what biophilia means. A lot of people don't know what biophilia means um, and it's a word that E.O. Wilson came up with that is about how we like to affiliate with forms of life. We have an innate urge to affiliate and be around nature and um, uh, birds and whatnot but I, I think that we need to redefine that a little and recognize that biophilia is a need to integrate not just an urge to affiliate but a need to integrate with other forms of life because of course if we were to look at whether we have um, a construct of, um, let's say, who's a guy, who's a girl, um, who's uh, uh, gay, <laughs> who's straight, who's religious, who's not religious, who's wealthy, who's not wealthy, all the things that separate us on a societal level. The fact is, is if I all asked you right now to close your mouth and close your nose, everybody, no matter what construct you come from, needs to breathe in about 10 seconds. And that breath comes from the aquatic and the terrestrial plants of this planet. So fundamentally, that is the, that is the core um, singular identity of humanity. We come from, from this planet and we're 100% dependent on it as a result. So what we can all agree on is that we need to eat, 
We need psychological well-being that, that nature brings us. And if we don't have that, we have this, which is like quite difficult. And this is like mostly like we're in a city right now and on a street corner, this is what I'd have to sound like. And it's like, it's not very nice. I mean, that's literally not even as loud as it would be. So that's what we sound like. And we sound like that because we've forgotten that this is the kind of soundscape. And what we have here is the kind of soundscape that makes it possible for us to think, for us to co collaborate, for us to, to, to actually be cognitively healthy and, um, and, and tranquil, you know? It's pretty nice. Anyway, so that's biophonic, we're biophilic. These are the things that make us feel right. So it's bizarre because we have this identity of, of nature being that thing and then humanity being humanity, but actually humanity and nature are exactly the same thing. We are completely integrated. And so it's very confusing to us like, well, if, if, if we have humanity and we have nature, then why, why is then what we do as humans not natural? Why can you say, how can you argue that what we do as humans is, is bad because we are nature, right? You just said that. Well, the point is that we are nature with the ability to construct and use nature. So we have this bizarre thing where we can say, I want to pick up a stick and use that to help me make a decision to kill an animal. And then that stick becomes a tool. It becomes technology. So we invented technology as a way to amplify our decision making, using nature to help us create um, uh, uh, autonomy over nature, really. So we've used nature to make technology and oh this is weird hang on and sorry this is supposed to be skipped and we've done that pretty well i mean we're, we're pretty good at it oh shit as you can see we've we've pretty much turned all this stuff into agricultural land we've managed to use technology in a way that not not just helps us um be more able to survive in ecology but has now made ecology a slave to technology so we use technology um, now in a way that makes us have to use ecology to promote it instead of the other way around instead of having ecology um, be the reason why we develop uh, technology and we and this has created a serious problem for us we're, we're now totally isolated from our biophilia we're, we're, we've created these kinds of existential issues where we're, we're, we're on the brink of the, of, 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 of the end of the world. Um, so the other forms of life that we have here haven't been able to deal with that, this misdirection of nature, the ability of us to decide the direction of nature in the wrong way. Um, so we have this massive destruction and, and, and not only uh, have we made a ecological environments ser a servant to technology, but ourselves. We've turned half of our, more of half of our population as servants to technology also. So we end up just lost. And of course we're having a biophilic paradox. And which is the same, you know, the, the, the first of these biophilic paradoxes we can call is that we're, we have the supporting resources that the biosphere depends on, the ones that we need to have our functionality are the same ones that we have now built our technology to depend on too. So ecology and technology are fighting each other for the supporting natural resources that we cannot do without. So we do this, we clear cut the Amazon basin, we go and we frack the shit out of everything, the boreal forests, we blow them up, we go dredge the oceans, we set fire to water, who the fuck knew we could do that? We've done that. We've put oil in, in you know, extensive of, of, of ocean that we can't even imagine in our minds. We dig up mountains, we just set fire to everything. <laughs> we, we blow up everything. We stick children who we've never met because we don't care about people that we've never met into terrible situations so that they can sift through shitty water to get the components for our computers that I'm using now. And who cares? They, we don't see them. We're not in touch with them. And, and it's mostly because disposable technology is so crucial to our idea of temporary conveniences, which we identify as modern living. So our living earth is basically a repository of materials and a depository for the waste of those materials. 
and that is totally unacceptable as we know. I think there's some slides in here that are not supposed to be in here, so I'm just going to go through them. So, you know, here you go, there's lots of shit, this is horrible, and we feel pretty powerless over this. You know, most of us here are trying to do something, but everybody, mostly on the planet, does not feel like they have any control over this at all. And that's because half the time we don't. What we've done with nuclear power and things like that, we do not have control over it. And that is why we have these catastrophic problems now, and we, can, um, we can't breathe, and uh, 500 people just died in Canada um, because of 50 degree heat uh, this week. So, you know, what the hell do we do? Well, uh, it's just nice, let's go to the pub, forget about it, let's watch some sports or some shit because it's easier to think about that or maybe like go shopping or something, that's cool. Everybody tells us shopping's good, so let's just go do that. Or actually maybe a rave, we could go to a rave instead, so let's go to a rave. Or, I mean, if we're rich enough, you could build a car and you could just like go to space in your car. Um, in fact, if you're rich enough, why don't you just go to space? and you can just leave everybody else behind and you can use all the resources of this earth to then build your rockets and whatever to go to a completely different planet and uh, use all the wealth that you have to go to this place that apparently is way better than here and we should invest in that because you know that's like really tempting um, and build this thing called Eden that actually looks exactly like earth. So you know, um, that's what we're doing now. That's actually what we're doing. That's what most of the planet is doing and the people with money are doing on the planet. Because making new things is more fun than fixing old ones. So we leave the giraffes and we leave the dolphins and we leave every other living creature to basically die catastrophically and quickly from this sudden collapse that we're having as we break the supporting resources of this planet trying to get rich trying to distract ourselves with some VR, virtual realities, and we just let it become, well, kind of like a game. Turn everything we know into some sort of construct that we can't even touch. So we know that if we keep making mistakes, we just lose at this game of life. We've now built machines that we have programmed according to not making mistakes. That is how we've programmed AI. Don't make a mistake, don't make a mistake. Learn from your mistakes and don't make it again. And that's how AI have won over us, over chess and, and, and Go, the most important um, cerebral games that we have. So our ability to think is um, also an example of how important it is for us to know how to deal with the mistakes we've made. And if we don't make them, we don't evolve and other things will evolve to take our place. So we can make these little robots and all of that stuff, but as long as our, in our minds we are corrupted, anything that we make that's a vision of us or an image of us as we are the god of all of these creations ends up looking like this crazy robot dog that nobody wants to have around and wiping out 60% of the animals. And, you know, that's it. So... I think we should just take a moment here together and just think about all of the animals that have not had a choice, that cannot decide how they want to use technology and how they want to use the planet and whether they want to go to Mars or not, and just um, give them a moment of silence. And then, of course, it's not just them, but it's also us. So as we know, we're also getting wiped out. We're wiping ourselves out. So we should take a moment for ourselves. Say goodbye to you, 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 and all of our children, and their grandchildren, and the rest of humanity. That's all, folks. pretty convincing right I mean we could leave it there because that's where we're going so the idea is that we don't leave it there and we try to do something else and understand that the way that we use technology is about how we decide to direct nature that is what it is so if we think about it in that time we can go from instead of being basically guilty of destroying the planet to 
taking charge over the future. And let's call this the moment that we have to do that. It's the only moment that we have left before we completely run out of time because we are already running out of time. And so putting that in the idea that this is peak time now. There's always this idea of peak oil. There's only so much oil. And then after that, you've got less oil than you ever have. And so it's on a downward spiral. There's no more exploitation because, I mean, there's exploitation of all the known resources, but there's no unknown resources anymore. That's peak oil. Now we know that there's, there is no more time left. There is no more time to exploit. So you have to use the time we have now because it is degrading rapidly. So this is peak time in order to, in order to um, address this problem. It's the last chance we have to be, use technology to help us integrate with the biosphere instead of turning the biosphere against us and having it choose or AI choose or whatever um, our future for us. So with that, um, we, I, I like to sort of bring everyone around to everyone's favourite topic because we've just been through the dregs of hell and everyone would love um, to see this poo emoji right now because, right? Are you happy? Does this make you happy? Come on. Come on. This is very nice. So, so, so Daddy, Daddy, do you want to tell everyone about what's the significance of poo?